This is the StoryWorks Roundtable, where we have conversations about craft. Because becoming a successful author begins with writing a great story. Hello and welcome to this week's StoryWorks Roundtable. Today, Robert, Catherine, and I are answering a listener's question. This came in from Ashley G on YouTube, a comment on our recent episode 261 on the Arkless protagonist. So Ashley, thank you so much for the comment. We love it when people write in and give us uh, fodder for the round table. (laughs) (laughs) Ashley wrote, I would love to hear you talk about writing stories from a non-protagonist POV. The Sherlock Holmes stories are an example, but there must be others and even some that don't use the POV character as a narrator. The story I'm writing follows two main characters. One is followed in third person with her as the POV character. The other character's storyline is followed in third person, but with her husband as the POV character. I found that the spouse is an emotional POV character, but doesn't have an independent arc. He is mostly reactive to his wife's arc because she is the main character of the storyline. It is an interesting divide to have because he's more emotional than her, yet she changes over the course of the story and he stays the same. Whereas with Watson, he, as the POV character, is the more emotional character and, as you said here, has more of an arc than the protagonist. So I think there's a lot we can unpack and a lot of different things we can talk about. Um, The first question is, were either of you able to think of any examples where somebody has a point of view character in the third person who is not, who does not have an independent arc, who is not the main character of the storyline? I can think of third person, no. Yeah. Right off the top of my head, no, I'd have to dig. <laughs> yes, and I'm not certain one exists. I mean, there certainly could be one. So if somebody has an example of this and she says third person point of view character who is not the central character and who does not have an independent arc, and I think the combination of those elements is particularly challenging. Mm -hmm. You know, we know of uh, first person narrators who are peripheral. They are not the central character in the Mm storyline. You know, Gatsby is the classic example where Nick is the first person narrator and he's serving as a witness to Gatsby and Daisy's affair. Mm -hmm. Right. So in that sense, he's, peripheral to the action, but he has an arc. He's the character who's changed at the end of the story. And so because he has the arc, he does have stakes. This is something I was thinking about earlier when I was thinking about this question. So if Nick is not Gatsby, if he's not the one having the affair and the one who ends up floating in the pool at the end, What does he stand to gain or lose? And it's all intangible. It's his sense of class in America, love, humanity, you know, what it means to what makes Gatsby great as opposed to just Gatsby, his reinvention of himself, perhaps his social climbing, perhaps, you know, so for Nick, the stakes are abstract and almost conceptual but they are still stakes and he is the one who changes, right? So I think when we look at this question of what do you do with a character who's not the central character in the action of the plot, what is required to keep that character engaging to a reader? Mm -hmm. And I think it's stakes and change, i.e. an arc. Yeah, I would agree. I think the ones that I'm thinking of are the same. Like if you're narrator character your point of view character the person who's telling you the story is focusing on someone else I still think their involvement has to matter and that's where I think you'd end up with an arc 
right? So mm-hmm. that's, I think that was the confusing part for me was how that would work out. I'm not saying it can't work out, but it would be interesting to see he's, I mean, it's his wife, the kid, you know, <laughs> so there is involvement there. So maybe there's, even if it's a slight change, there's some sort of reaction to what she's going through um, that maybe isn't readily apparent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My, I mean, my question would be the intent of it because it's this. Uh, I think, as I said to you, sort of over email exchange. To me, it seems as if it's purely a narrative device. That's all it is. Mm-hmm. Um, so why are we doing it, and what is the author's intent? And I suspect it's hard to pull off well simply because you're already putting an extra layer of detachment in. So maybe you want to do that because you want an unreliable narrator or you don't want to be in the protagonist's head or one of the protagonist's head um, because it sounds like I'm not quite sure who is the central protagonist of this particular story. Yeah, well, and it sounds like, well, I'm maybe, and I'm going to extrapolate here, I don't know your story, but like maybe the wife, the main character, is kind of a person we wouldn't want to be in her head. Right. And it maybe turns the reader off if they were in her head too close. But because her husband loves her, there's that reframing of the reader trying to get behind her because her husband's behind her. So there would be a reason Mm -hmm. I could see a reason for doing it if you were trying to create almost a buffer for the reader between her actions and your reaction to it because you're seeing it through the husband's lens. Um, but yeah, it would be interesting to see or know a little bit more about why that is and how that would work. Yeah, it would be. And I think we should just state before we go any further that we haven't read Ashley's work. No. And so we are not criticizing no, no, Ashley's no. work. We're just speculating on, well, how would this work? And what if this and maybe that? Yeah. And so Ashley and everybody else listening know that this is not a critique of your writing and we aren't saying it does or does not work. We Mm-mm. we couldn't because we haven't read it. So let's just be very clear yeah. about that. And Robert, I think you were starting to say something. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, if, if, I, if I sort of zoom back out a bit and think about why I would read fiction, it's because... I want to be transported and I want to be attached to a protagonist. And that's why obviously we, we like change and we like arcs and things like that because they do take us on a journey. So the, the trick would ha- would be you'd have to work really hard to, to attach the reader to a character who isn't the one going through the changes. Um, so so uh, Ashley's comment about, you know, I found that the spouse to be um, an emotional POV character is probably central to that. Mm-hmm. Because without that, it might feel like it's just, as you said, it's a like a witness or an observer or a court reporter where there might be interest, but then we lack intrigue and excitement. Um, and how do you represent things which are central to fiction, such as a crisis or, a, or an impossible dilemma, when it's seen through the eyes of somebody to whom that doesn't matter? Um so, mm-hmm. so I think that's why you see it more rarely because it it's complex to to pull off, um, and it does mean that you're playing, I think, with two different sets of emotional connections to the reader. So you've got the protagonist that is being viewed by the POV character, and then you you somehow got to keep the reader's interest with the POV character, but not but not attach them too strongly if they don't have an arc, <laughs> you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, I would love to know what Ashley's reason is for this choice. I think what Catherine was saying about maybe wanting to create a buffer between the reader and this character by using the husband's point of view is, is an intriguing possibility. And, you know, that, that sense of connection you're talking about, Robert, it's so critical to any story, to engaging the reader's empathetic connection. And so if we're empathizing with the husband because he's the point of view character, but the wife is central to it, I wonder, does that put the husband in sort of a victim role? Like, you know, the action of the story is happening around him, to him in his presence with his wife being the central figure. And so he is in a reactionary position and maybe 
he's in a state of helplessness, you know, like if a family member, if a loved one is dealing with an addiction or a great depression or something, you can't necessarily do that much for Mm -hmm. that person. Right. But you might be so deeply affected and very empathetic to the reader. And so that could be a situation where that might work to have the point of view character not be central, but then you would still need the stakes. You would still need some sort of change, that sense of an arc at the end, because you mentioned the journey, Robert, the reader, if we get to the end of the book and we don't feel like we've gone on a journey with the protagonist, if we've just sort of been subjected to somebody else's chaos, then will we feel satisfied or cheated or maybe a little beat up? Like, oh, I just went through this, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. process with this character and there was no value to it, you know, redeeming value, but not in the sense of a happy ending, in the sense of transformation. Yeah. I think it it's really key what you were saying about like Nick and the great Gatsby is it wasn't like a physical change that he went through. Right. And I think maybe that's a little more hard to talk about. Like, Oh, my character didn't change. They didn't go from this to that or move from here to there, but maybe their values changed or inside their, you know, they had a thematic change or something that was a little more subtle than maybe the protagonist went through, but you can still track it as a reader because you're going through that cathartic moment with them. So, Mm -hmm. right. And I think too, to reflect on what you're saying there about Gatsby, you know, if Gatsby or Daisy changed, we wouldn't have the statement about the idle rich in 20th century America that Fitzgerald was making. And so if the great Gatsby is a critique of a certain class and a certain era, in a certain culture, you lose that if Gatsby and Daisy, the central figures in the plot, change. So Mm -hmm. we need Nick's disappointment and disillusionment. And, um, you know, we need him to carry the burden of that forward through his life in 20th century America in order to have that critique. Which is the shift we create in the reader, you know. Yeah, and also in The Great Gatsby, Nick has agency. Um, So, one, I mean, again, we've only got a very sort of brief comment from Ashley. So, um, but looking at it with, uh, you know, the the spouse is reactive or mostly reactive. So, you you know, you've got a secondary problem there of, of trying to show the main character's agency through um, a secondary character's point of view. Um, when the secondary character doesn't have much agency because they're mostly reacting. So it's an interesting proposition to, to solve in, in fiction in that way. And I, it, it's making it, I mean, it, again, this is, I guess, why we've got the emotional husband because mm-hmm. there's the, you, what you could get is a nice feeling of being trapped from something like that. Um, and of course, then if the husband never escapes that or is always feeling at effect of it, then the, that maybe that's the purpose of the story, you know. So, so I think without knowing more about the the overall premise, it's hard to comment on how mm-hmm. that works. Um, but I guess what you know, a- Ashley was asking is, you know, do we know of any? And, <laughs> and the answer is no, no. <laughs> the answer is not really, and probably for good reason because it's it's perhaps a little. I don't know, maybe we're making too much of it, you know, perhaps it's a little more experimental or hard to pull off. So mm-hmm. you you rarely see masterworks like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not doable, actually. So, you know, yeah. so right. with some of the things we've been talking about, taking into consideration. Yeah, well, I was just thinking about even other multiple point of view stories that I know of, like more ensemble cast stuff. And the only time that I've ever had like a point of view that wasn't a protagonist I hated it because it felt like it was coming from the wrong point of view Mm -hmm. Um, and I think again that stakes and agency issues so I think pulling off a non-protagonist point of view or a non-witness who has an arc style point of view is going to really struggle with why does this matter Um, and getting the reader to really have that Mm buy-in 
Yeah, exactly. And I think it's interesting that Ashley mentions having two point of view characters, this mm-hmm. one who is central in her storyline, and then the husband who's peripheral in his wife's storyline. And, you know, not having seen any of the text, again, I can't say if it does or does not work in Ashley's manuscript, but just in general, I would be very concerned that this would be a story where readers would identify with the other point of view character and be tempted to skip or skim Mm -hmm. the husband's point of view chapters because of that sense of, you know, lack of stakes, lack of urgency, lack of meaning and connection. It would, it, it's very interesting as a literary experiment and I would love to see it accomplished. I think it would be very doable in a short story, mm-hmm. Yes, maybe doable in a novella and really hard to pull off in a novel for the reasons we've been talking about. Which doesn't mean it can't be done or it shouldn't be done, but uh... <laughs> <laughs> we're always up for pushing the envelope, right? It's just these are the struggles that you're going to have. Is you know what is a protagonist? What is a point of view character? You know, making right. two of those distinct is a little bit hard. And if I if you sort of stripped away POV completely, uh, and you went back to what what is a POV but non POV like omniscient. Um, you know, how would we as a reader feel if we followed a character in, in an omnisciently narrated story, if we followed a character for a large portion of that who didn't have any real impact on the story? Mm-hmm. You'd, you'd probably struggle. So just because we get a POV and get inside someone's head emotionally doesn't necessarily mean that it makes it a story. So I think that would be the the things to consider is how how am I going to convey the wife's agency stakes arc in a meaningful way to the reader, but it poses an interesting problem because by default you get cognitive dissonance you you know you get the, the you've got the husband's filters so mm-hmm. that to me would be the interesting part of it is is uh, you know he's reactive but you get also his model of the world imposed on that, which I think would be the way I would look to pulling it, pulling it off anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, as you say this, Robert, I'm still coming back to the idea of stakes that the husband needs to have something to gain or lose. Like if you witness somebody having a freak out in the grocery store, you know, throwing a tantrum or having a meltdown, it's a curiosity. You might stand back and watch because, well, that's unusual. Check that out. But if the person having the meltdown is your spouse, and now everybody's looking at both of you together, and you've got to try to soothe the spouse or fix the situation or pick up the stuff she knocked off of the shelves or get her safely out to the car or, you know, you have to manage the situation, then you aren't the one having the freak out, but you do have something Mm -hmm. at stake there. Mm -hmm. And that can be quite emotional depending on how you respond to it and how used you are to the wife's situation and all of those, those other circumstances. So, you know, reactive is one thing, but reactive with meaning and something to gain or lose and involvement is another yeah. thing. Yeah, I would, I mean, again, we haven't read it, right? But I would argue if you have a husband that's that close, you probably already have that those ties worked mm-hmm. in and maybe it's just not as easy for you to see it because you're so focused on your main character. Um but you're right. I mean, the, if he's the emotional point of view and he's the husband, he's choosing actively to stay. Mm-hmm. And so the agency is there, even if he's reacting to the situations. No kids, but I have a dog. <laughs> That's okay. We like dogs. Yeah. Yes. You know, something that comes to mind as you're as you're speaking, Catherine, and thinking about this, the closeness of the husband and is by definition, does that degree of closeness make him, you know, 
give him stakes and investment in what's happening. And it reminds me of Richard Yates' story, Revolutionary Road. And I watched the film before I read the novel. And I loved the film because it felt like a dual POV story. I was convinced it was a dual POV with the husband and the wife, each having very strong points of view in the story. And at the end, in the climax, the wife is the one at the climax. She is the climax, what happens to her. Um, and then I read the book. And I was I was so excited to see how this author handled this dual point of view, right? And it ends up being the husband's point of view. And he goes a little multi after part one, and he pulls in like some friends and neighbors points of view. But the wife doesn't have a point of view until the climax. That chapter is the only chapter where we're actually inside the wife's head. And I was really frustrated because my expectation of connecting to the wife the way I did in the film was unmet. You know, if I had read the book first, I would have had a different experience of it. I wouldn't have had that expectation and it might have just been like, oh, isn't that interesting? But having had the experience I did, I am still critical of the way Yates wrote it because I feel like he maybe didn't want to tackle the wife's point of view. It was safe for him to stay in the husband's point of view until that moment when the wife makes the fatal choice that she does, right? And so we lost the wife's mounting frustration and desperation that led up to that choice in the climax. And so, you know, is the husband's proximity to the wife enough? Yes, you know, he loses his wife. He has to raise children alone. He certainly has stakes that come out of that climactic moment. But I didn't have the depth of empathy for the wife's decision and the depth of investment in her choice that I experienced when I watched the movie, when I went through the story for the first time. Right. It's definitely a conundrum, isn't it? You know, it the husband would have to have a in Ashley's example. The hu the husband would have to have a problem to solve. I think for it to be a useful POV character. Because I was thinking more about what you said, and then what Catherine was saying, and then back to overall Prince story structure principles. Um, it would be. I think it'd be really hard if it was just em an emotionally reactive character that had such a huge huge part. Um, I can I can see small parts here and there working fine, which is probably why we said, yeah, you can make it work in a short story. Um, but to maintain a reader's interest, I think the husband has to have a problem to solve. Now, probably by default, as Catherine said, he probably does because he's married to the main character who's going through the changes. <laughs> so, you know, that that might be where where Ashley's making this work. So, yeah, it's interesting. You definitely threw us a curveball, Ashley. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. And I hope that you got some food for thought out of the conversation. Definitely. Out of We'd our love confusion. to hear in the comments. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, and please, everybody, throw us comments. We love talking about this stuff. Let us know what you're working on and bring us your, your thoughts and questions, and we will dig into them. Thank you for listening to this week's StoryWorks Roundtable. If you enjoy the show, if you learn anything about StoryCraft, or if you just feel like you're part of our community, the best way you can show us your support is by giving us a five-star review wherever you find podcasts. We would really appreciate it. Now, don't forget, we will be back in two weeks with a brand new episode and you know, these off weeks are a great chance to go into our back catalog. We have over 250 episodes on StoryCraft. All of them are cataloged with show notes that are time stamped at storyworkspodcast.com. All right, have a great writing week, and we will see you in two weeks. Thank you for listening to the StoryWorks Roundtable. 
Find all our shows, show notes, and videos at storyworkspodcast.com.